give you a, like a whirlwind tour through some of the things that are going on in art and science nationally. Um, but I wanted to start with this probably by now pretty familiar slide if you've been on the internet at all. This, this is a pretty familiar image. But um, one of the things that I like to think about, like what is, what's in the middle of that intersection? I think it's actually a lot more, it's a lot bigger of an intersection than we realize. And the more I talk about art and science with people, the more I get people coming up to me saying, oh yeah, we're doing a poetry reading at our biological field station this year. And oh yeah, I'm a dancer and I've been working with this cell biologist. And the similarities between the scientist path and the artist path are becoming much clearer to us now. There's, um, there's a lot about art and science that are very similar. and We used to think that they were very different. It's um, setting out on an uncharted path and you're going into territory that you don't really know where it's going to end up. When you're an artist, when you're a scientist, you don't know where your research is going to end up. You don't know where your art project is going to end up. You invent new tools and techniques to get there. Um, and you're exploring the world to try and find out, you know, what, trying to find out some reality about the world and looking for, you know, beauty and truth. So, um, <clears throat> this um, sort of contemporary look at how to marry art and science back together started really with this lecture um, by C.P. Snow, who was both a novelist and a physicist. And he had a lecture in 1959 that was so popular he turned it into a book, and it's become kind of a starting point for a lot of people talking about art and science, and I'm just going to flip that. There are a few organizations that are promoting art and science uh, collaborations or who are inviting artists to go into to work in scientist labs or inviting scientists to work with artists and promoting that kind of work. And they're all over the place, but some of the ones that have been active for a very long time, I'm just going to pop through them really quickly. This is um, Leonardo ISAS, which is the International Society for Art Sciences and Technology. Um, which was founded by an astronomer, Frank Molina, and his, is now being carried on by his son, Roger Molina, who's in Texas. Um, so if you guys want these links, you can get them from me later. It's really well worth exploring. ASCII is uh, run by Cynthia Panucci, who's in Florida, and she's been doing this since um, 1988, and she's providing an opportunity for art science, people who are working in art science to um, to exhibit their work through her website, and she has sort of like a highlight of you know, <coughs> highlighted artist of the month, and um, has lots of resources for artists and scientists, and places where there are you know jury shows and opportunities for people who work in art and science. So she's a good connector in that way. <coughs> and then the third one that I'll talk about is the UCLA Art Side Lab, where there's a lot of work going on with um, technology and dance and video and artists using labs and all kinds of stuff going on. So that's a really good one to look up. If you go to their website, they've got you know, tons of different things going on. So these are just a few, just a handful of things that are, that are going on out there. Okay. <coughs> so here's an example of someone who's shown at UCLA um, SciArt Labs, and she's actually at the School of Visual Arts in New York, Suzanne Anker, and she uses the um, materials of science and she has a lab she actually has set up a lab at the School of Visual Arts that's a biology lab and encourages her students to use you know um, genetic material to use plants to use bones and to use um, data and just like think about mining the stuff of science for making art and these are made with stem cells and you can just pop through these just for I think they're really useful they're just like sort of ghost like images and fascinating. And this next set of images is from her Rorschach series where she takes a Rorschach ink blot and imagines what it would look like if it were a three-dimensional object. So, uh, and these are incredible. There's like, you know, there are like 20 or 30 of them. They're really, all of them just remarkably beautiful. I want to hang them on my wall. Um, so these are made from resin and the ones, the prior ones were made from sort of a cast iron material. <coughs> Aren't they incredible? They look like pieces of a spinal column. Yeah. <coughs> they do look like vertebrae because they have that you know, beautiful yeah. symmetry and complexity at the same time. Um, I have to thank Nicole Gerardo for sending me this link to Natalie Meibach, who is a, this is a fascinating artist who is taking data from oceanic readings and atmospheric readings and taking the actual data and turning it into both sculptures where she does a lot of weaving with baskets and then move to the next slide 
and musical scores. And she actually plays the, so she takes the data, turns it into a musical, and the, the musical score itself is an interesting visual object. But then if you go on her website and listen to what they sound like, it's like you're listening to data. It's so cool. <laughs> so I encourage you to go to her website. Okay. Um, this is one of my favorite. So the, the last two artists, Suzanne Anker and Natalie Weibach, are sort of artists who are firmly in the art world, who are taking materials of science or data and they're turning it into work. And they're, they're really coming at it from the aspect of being an artist. This is a project that I think is a really perfect hybrid of art and science because it's a bunch of artists, it's a, it's a bunch of scientists and designers who end up making art in the process of making science. So the, the question that they, were, that they were grappling with was how would you set up a collaboration between human <coughs> and, and animal design? So if you're, if you're going to try to set up a design where you're collaborating with silkworms and you want to actually really kind of enter the world of the silkworms and like you learn about the way they design and kind of collaborate with that. How would that work? And what kind of a structure could you create? So, so this was their idea, <clears throat> was taking a, a set of, of uh, geometrical shapes of hexagons and pentagons and fitting them together and threading them and then having the silkworms complete the project. So I'll show you how this goes. There's a wonderful video that you should visit on the internet of this process. So for the first thing they did was they studied, they actually put these silkworms on a, a, a square plate to see you know, what was the pattern that they would do if they were just like laying down silk randomly. And then they took that and they created these hexagonal shapes and they programmed a sewing machine, I, I don't want to call it a sewing machine, but a, a sort of a threading machine to go from one place to another to create a similar pattern. So they were taking the math, it wasn't completely random, there was some complex, there was really complex math going on with what that pattern was. So they took that program and programmed their machine to do something similar on a much larger scale. And here you can see the machine is sort of like, what it does is goes, it wraps around one and it goes to the next one. Okay. And then they attach them together into a globe. Okay. And then put the silkworms on. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is just magic. So, go ahead. so you'll see the silkworms have sort of taken those threads that were, the threads were, the design of the threads was inspired by the silkworms that they observed, and then the new silkworms are coming on and sort of you know, doing their thing on top of that. Okay. And this is the result. And I just think, it, this is to me, that little section between art science, you know, that's wonder, this just, it really just makes me cry. It's so beautiful. It's capturing this, you know, the, the, the beauty and the complexity of what the caterpillars are doing and making it big so that we can experience and get actually under it. If you go to the next slide, you can see this is what it looks like from above. It's just a beautiful object. And this is, you know, hanging in MIT. It's not, I think it's not there anymore, but go ahead. And look at that. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> so this is one of my, this is one of my favorite sort of like yardstick for like how to do art science. That's from the inside. That's from the inside of the, of the, uh -huh. and, and, you, and they, they, for some reason, there are these sort of random large holes that they leave in their in their weaving. I just think it's remarkably beautiful. So, yeah. so this is a really interesting project. Margaret and Christine Wertheim are sisters. I think they're twin sisters, and um, they are using crochet. It turns out crochet is a really great way to model um, hyperbolic forms, like. Um, you know what a sea slug is, nudibranchs, where you have these sort of very undulating edges. Um, and you'll see these undulating edges in corals and things like that. And, and crochet, because if you start with a flat surface, but you keep adding stitches as you go out, you get this sort of like curve, and it just keeps getting curvier and curvier. So it turns out to be a, a great way to show that. So um, this is a show that they did at Williamson Gallery, and that's another one of those uh, galleries have been promoting art science for a very long time. Stephen Nowlin is the director of that gallery, and if you're interested in pursuing this, you should definitely look them up. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. 
Um, so this is the crochet coral reef project that uh, the Wertheims, the Institute for Figuring, have been doing. And one of the things that's cool about this is that um, it's a collaborative community project. So they go to, they've been all over the world, and they'll go into a community and they will get people to volunteer to crochet stuff. And it's just, you know, thousands and thousands of people who participated in it. That's, they have, Tragically, last year it had a fire in their, um, in their main offices, so I'm not sure where they are with their project right now, but, but it's really worth investigating. Um, so this is the last slide I'll show before I want to show a really cool video because um, I want to talk about how <clears throat> both the Institute for Figuring and this group, the Black Label Movement, are using art to communicate science, but they don't compromise the art. And um, Black Label Movement is a, is a fantastic example of artists collaborating with scientists to try to communicate art, um, to communicate the science through their art, and, um, and also kind of changing the science in the process. Um, so Black Label refers to, um, some of you folks are old enough to remember in the, I guess it was the 80s, we had these, uh, this sort of fad of having generic products. We had like a white milk carton with the black just said milk on it. So that's what Black Label refers to is that they're just movement. They don't have costumes and sets and elaborate designs and stuff. It's just movement. So they've been collaborating lately with a scientist called David Odie, who is a cell biologist. And David Odie, they're trying to model cellular movement from the outside. If you look at the whole cell, it kind of looks graceful and it's sort of happening sort of slowly, but what's happening on the inside can be really dynamic. You have molecules that are assembling and breaking apart, and you have these reactions, and they're really physical. And so this dance company is particularly <coughs> physical. You'll see them in a second, and they just like they jump on top of each other and they bang into each other. And every time I watch a video of them, I think, man, yeah, they must all be bruised at the end of the <laughs> dance or, or dance performance. Um, but they have been working in Woods Hole. Uh, last summer, they took this collaboration with the cell biologist, and they weren't just performing the work that they had created, that they had co-created with the scientist. They were kind of workshopping it with the scientists. So Woods Hole is kind of, um, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of a, a summer camp for cell biologists from all over the world. It's a place to go for marine, the marine biology lab is there, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute is there, and it's just there's a lot of science going on. So they go out onto the lawn and perform something, and they kind of get feedback from the scientists that are out there to sort of say, well, did, did we get that part right? Did that come across? You know, how would we change that? So the community of scientists at Woods Hole were also helping to shape this work, so I found that really, really exciting too. So I'm just going to end with this really short video that is actually a TED Talk, but it's not like any other TED Talk that you've seen. It's about using dance to communicate science. So I'll just put it. This is the same company, Carl Plank and Black Black Lake. Directly into your eyes, 
And that's why your brain is forming an image of me standing here. Now, a laser is different. It also uses photons, but they're all synchronized. And if you focus them into a beam, <laughs> what you have is an incredibly useful tool. The control of a laser is so precise to perform surgery inside of an eye. You can use it to store massive amounts of data, and you can use it for this beautiful experiment that my friend was struggling to explain. First, you trap atoms in a special bottle. It uses electromagnetic fields to isolate the atoms from the noise of the environment. And the atoms themselves are quite violent. But if you fire lasers that are precisely tuned to the right frequency, an atom will briefly absorb those photons and tend to slow down. Little by little, it gets colder until eventually it approaches absolute zero. Now, if you use the right kind of atoms and you get them cold enough, something truly bizarre happens. It's no longer a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It enters a new state of matter called a superfluid. The atoms lose their individual identity, and the rules from the quantum world take over. And that's what gives superfluids such spooky properties. For example, if you shine light through a superfluid, it is able to slow photons down to 60 kilometers per hour. Another spooky property is that it flows with absolutely no viscosity or friction. So if you were to take the lid off that bottle, it won't stay inside. A thin film will creep up the inside wall, flow <laughs> over the top, and right out the outside. Now, of course, the moment that it does hit the outside environment, and its temperature rises by even a fraction of a degree, it immediately turns back into normal matter. Superfluids are one of the most fragile things we've ever discovered. And this is the great pleasure of science, the defeat of our intuition through experimentation. But the experiment is not the end of the story, because you still have to transmit that knowledge to other people. I have a PhD in molecular biology. I still barely understand what most scientists are talking about. So as my friend was trying to explain that experiment, it seemed like the more he said, the less I understood. Because if you're trying to give someone the big picture, a complex idea, really capture its essence. The fewer words you use, the better. In fact, the ideal may be to use no words at all. I remember thinking, my friend could have explained that entire experiment with a dance. Of course, there never seemed to be any dancers around him either. Now, the idea is not as crazy as it sounds. I started a contest four years ago called Dance Your PhD. Instead of explaining their research with words, scientists have to explain it with dance. Now, surprisingly, it seems to work. Dance really can make science easier to understand. But don't take my word for it. Go on the internet and search for Dance Your PhD. There are hundreds of dancing scientists waiting for it. The most surprising thing that I've learned while running this contest is that some scientists are now working directly with dancers on their research. For example, at the University of Minnesota, there's a biomedical engineer named David Odie, and he works with dancers to study how cells move. They do it by changing their shape. When a chemical signal washes up on one side, it triggers the cell to expand its shape on that side because the cell is constantly touching and tugging at the environment. So that allows cells to move along in the right directions. But what seems so slow and graceful from the outside is really more like chaos inside. Because cells control their shape with a skeleton of rigid protein fibers. And those fibers are constantly falling apart. But just as they explode, more proteins attach to the ends and grow them longer. So it's constantly changing just to remain exactly the same. Now, David builds mathematical models of this, and then he tests those in the lab. But before he does that, he works with dancers to figure out what kinds of models to build in the first place. It's basically efficient brainstorming. And when I visited David to learn about his research, he used dancers to explain it to me, rather than the usual method, PowerPoint. And this brings me to my modest proposal. I think that bad PowerPoint presentations are a serious threat to the global economy. <laughs> now, it does depend on how you measure it, of course. But one estimate has put the drain at $250 million per day. 
Now that assumes half our presentations for an average audience of four people with salaries of $35,000. And it conservatively assumes that about a quarter of the presentations are a complete waste of time. And given that there are some, apparently, 30 million PowerPoint presentations created every day, that would indeed add up to an annual waste of $100 billion. <laughs> of course, that's just the time for, for losing, sitting through. <laughs> there are other costs. Because PowerPoint is a tool, and like any tool, it can and will be abused. To borrow a concept from my country's CIA, it helps you to soften up your audience. It distracts them with pretty pictures, irrelevant data, it allows you to create the illusion of confidence, the illusion of simplicity, and most destructively, the illusion of understanding. So now my country is $15 trillion in debt. Our leaders are working tirelessly to try and find ways to save money. One idea is to drastically reduce public support for the arts. For example, our National Endowment for the Arts, with its $150 million budget, Slashing that program would immediately reduce the national debt by about 1,000%. One, one, one certainly can't argue with those numbers. However, once we eliminate public funding for the arts, there will be some drawbacks. The artists on the street will swell the rents of the unemployed. Many will turn to drug abuse and prostitution. And that will inevitably lower property values in urban neighborhoods. All of this could wipe out the savings we're hoping, to make, we're hoping to make in the first place. I shall now, therefore, propose my own thoughts, which I hope will not be liable to the least objection. Once we eliminate public funding for the artists, let's put them back to work by using them instead of PowerPoint. <coughs> As a test case, I propose we start with American dancers. After all, they are the most perishable of their kind, prone to injury and very slow to heal due to our healthcare system. <laughs> Rather than dancing our PhD, we should use dance to explain all of our complex problems. Imagine our politicians using dance to explain why we must invade a foreign country or bail out an investment bank. It's sure to help. Of course, someday, in the deep future, a technology of persuasion, even more powerful than PowerPoints, may be invented, rendering dancers unnecessary as tools of rhetoric. However, I trust that by that day, we shall have passed this present financial calamity. Perhaps by then, we will be able to afford the luxury of just sitting in an audience with no other purpose than to witness the human form in motion. Symbiosis Art Science Alliance, Simbasa, which uh, just started last year, and our goal is to try to connect arts organizations with science organizations so that they can create and turn partnerships between their artists and their scientists to cross over. And um, we're also 
uh, co-sponsoring a national meeting in 2015 at Brown University with Brown University and RISD and a bunch of these other art partners all over the country to come together and have the first big national. There have been a lot of little sort of symposia about like what are we really talking about with art science, but there has yet to be like a really big national meeting. To, there's enough going on out there that it's time to do that, so we're pretty excited about that. So my, um, my email is really easy to remember. I'll tell you a story, a um, <clears throat> very short story, and then I'll let you go. Um, when I first started working with art science um, collaborations, I was working with a couple of people at Duke University who are now emeritus faculty um, that are sort of like the fathers of the field of biomechanics. And um, uh, Stephen Vogel was one of them. And I was getting ready to, to work with um, his research. He works in ballistics and all kinds of things, the ways that biological things fling out, you know, springs and all kinds of things like that. And we were going to work with a dancer. It just seemed really obvious to me to sort of do some dance with that. So I was partnering him with some dance friends of mine. He said, well, I guess so as long as the scientists don't have to dance. <laughs> and I said, that's okay, Steve. The science can dance. So that's my email, sciencecandance at gmail.com. If you want to contact me, happy to hear from you, and I'll try to hook you up with other people that are doing stuff around the country and hopefully bring more of it into the southeast. There's a lot of stuff starting to happen here, too, so pretty exciting. Thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs> Nancy, I have just two comments. Uh, first of all, John Bohannon was my classmate at Oxford. And no way! So, awesome. Um, I was fascinated by him then, and that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. But when I was at Oxford, I wrote my master's um, thesis on 17th century Flemish art. But that brings me to the point that it's worth stating again that in the 15th and 16th century in the Renaissance, you had the creation of the Wunderkammer, the Cabinet of Curiosity. And that was the origin of both scientific medical exploration, but also the modern museum. And the two were one. And so in the Blender Camera, you had medical specimens, animal specimens, but also works of fine art, and they were one and the same. Right. And from that, they branched out right. to scientific exploration, but also the modern museum. Yeah, so thank you for bringing that little piece of history. But yeah, something that I you know, don't often go that far back talking mm -hmm. about art science, because I, I start, kind of start talking with the divorce, and then I start talking about how we get back together. But, but you know, in the era of the same era you're talking about, also the age of exploration, you know, percent. <coughs> Europe was sending ships all over the world, and they would put an artist on the ship because there was no photography, and the artist was also a scientist. You know, they'd go out and do botany and, and collect animals and collect all kinds of specimens and paint them, and they had to have a lot of scientific training to do that as well. And also, a lot of the earlier, a lot of the early uh, medical illustration. There's a little blurb on the outside. If you go to the sort of central hallway where the medical illustrations are, there's a, a history of medical illustrations. It's really quite interesting. I learned a lot putting that together. That's kind of interesting to read. So, uh, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? All right. Thank you for coming. Thanks.